All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, Competency-Based Education in the Iron Triangle, demonstrating how protecting quality, expanding access, and containing costs can effectively address the equity imper imperative. If you are not here for this flight, um, please leave now. I see that many of you have actually taken the exit rows. Um, <clears throat> so good for you on that. Um, uh, welcome. I'm Allison Cadlick with Public Agenda. Um, and I will be the moderator for um, today's panel. And with me on the panel is Amy Leitnan. Uh, she is the Deputy Director for Higher Ed Programs at New America Foundation. And to her left is Charla Long. She is the Founding Dean of the College of Professional Studies at Lipscomb University and the um, mastermind of the Lipscomb CBE program. Is that the right way to put it? That'll work. Better than evil <laughs> genius, right? And also evil genius. <laughs> and Lori Dodge um, from Brandman University. She's the vice provost at Brandman and the chief architect um, and brain behind their competency-based education program. So with that, I just want to take a minute to set a little bit of context, and then we'll dive in. We want to um, make sure that there's plenty of time for questions. Um, and also just to make sure that we're able to have a conversation up here rather than presentation style sorts of things. So um, just to set the context um, and my involvement in this, the public agenda has been helping to provide um, facilitation and project management and infrastructure support to the Competency-Based Education Network, which is a group of institutions, um, field leader institutions that um, have built um, full degree programs, competency-based degree programs, and have uh, indicated over time the great desire to work together on common challenges to building high-quality, scalable models. Um, and that work originally started uh, in 2012. There was a convening hosted by the Lumina Foundation to bring together what was then the universe of institutions working seriously in the competency-based education space. And at that time, the number was about 20. Um, half of those institutions were first-generation innovators, and the other half were sort of the newer comers to the landscape, the SNUs and the Wisconsins and Northern Arizona, et cetera. So fast forward from September of 2012 to where we are now, and if you look at the landscape, um, there has been a tremendous explosion of interest in competency-based education. There's been an explosion of um, expressions of building programs, right? So if you look at the numbers now, it's actually hard to say how many institutions are building programs, but we hear numbers like 200, 250. So if you look at just the massive increase of interest in competency-based education over the last couple of years, um, some important questions are raised. Um, important questions about, well, is this just the latest fad? Is this going to go the way of MOOCs? Um, or is this something profound? Um, is, it, um, is this about, in, when you think about or when you hear about competency-based education in the national landscape, there are some narratives, common narratives that we hear, and they're often in tension. Some of those narratives have to do with um, possibly a more cost-effective way for institutions to better meet the needs of learners from all backgrounds, and this brings us to this concept of the Iron Triangle, right? Cost, quality, and access. Um, how is it that American higher ed can address these issues effectively and meet the needs of learners of all backgrounds in this country, provide high quality, cost effective, affordable uh, paths to the post-secondary credentials that are increasingly necessary for success in this world that we live in? So this is the context in which this panel um, is, uh, is here to talk about and think about these issues together. and so. With that, I want to kick it off and have uh, the panelists talk each for a couple of minutes about their, their work in this space. Um, and with that, I just want to start with a question to orient this. Um, for Lori and Sharla, um, for you, from the institutional perspective, if uh, while you're talking about your, your work in competency-based education, you could also um, help us uh, understand why it is that your institutions sought to build competency-based programs. What was the problem? that you were trying to solve when you decided to build these programs. And then for Amy, um, what is the policy, the national federal policy landscape in which institutions are building programs? And what is it that, you know, what are the big questions on the minds of, um, 
of policymakers when it comes to this increasingly robust and mysterious landscape. So with that, Lori. Thank you, Allison. Um, I'm Lori Dodd from Bramman University, as Allison said, and um, I want to tell you just a little bit, give you a little context of uh, who Bramman University is first, so you'll then know where our competency-based education program sits in. So Brandman is a private, uh, nonprofit, regionally accredited institution. Our home location is in Irvine, California, but we have 28 campuses uh, in the state of California and Washington um, and six military bases. So um, <clears throat> we have uh, about 52 programs from associates up through two doctoral programs. The other thing that you should know is our delivery model. So our delivery model is we have fully online programs and we have blended programs. All of our programs that used to be face-to-face -face are half, tech, half technology, half online. So that's a key component when I start talking about our competency-based program because there's steps along this journey that we already had in place. Um, the other thing, we serve primarily adult students. Um, we uh, have a 70% graduation rate, which is fantastic for uh, that uh, population especially. Um, our student loan default rate is 3.5% uh, and considering the national average is 13.7%. Uh, that's also a strong indicator uh, for us. So that's kind of the context that our competency-based program uh, sits in. Um, <clears throat> so Allison asked, why did we think about starting a program? And um, it really was to address the Iron Triangle. We were looking at access for students and equity, um, also affordable education. We are a private nonprofit, so what does affordable mean for also for uh, private institutions? Um, and maintain that stamp of quality. So uh, um, a piece also for us that helped us take that next step was we had what I call good assessment bones we had good assessment structures already in place um, before we thought, we had, so we have technology and we have assessment. So we kind of felt ready to take that next step for competency-based education. So let me describe our program a little bit um, and then we'll, we'll have time for a Q&A throughout this whole part. So we launched a Bachelor's of Business Administration program in October of 14. And um, we started working on this in 2013 um, based upon two white papers. One white paper looked at business models and other programs that were available. And the second white paper looked at pedagogy, student learning, what's the best approach if you're looking at competency-based education. Um, our program has 13 competencies around general education. So that's kind of that first piece. Uh, based upon the degree qualification profile and AAC and U LEAP es essential learning outcomes. So examples of some of those competencies are creative and critical thinking, uh, human experience, methods and applications of natural science, social systems, in addition to things that you would normally see like quantitative fluency and oral and written communication. Then there are 35 competencies um, on the business core. And there are anywhere from 9 to 14, depends on your emphasis area, um, in business. Um, so your choice, students' choices are information systems management, logistics and supply chain management, management and organizational leadership, um, and marketing. So students can choose their emphasis area within the degree. <coughs> In order for a student to be admitted into the competency-based education program, for us, and what we learned through one of the white papers, is it's really important that students are ready for this type of learning. And so our students, part of the admission packet, is they go through a competency intro module called a SIM. It's about three weeks, though students can take a little bit longer. It is exactly like our online competency module, so students get to learn how to navigate this and um, figure out the timing and, you know, is, is technology good, a good fit for me? Can I navigate this uh, iPad as I go from lesson to lesson? What do assessments look like? Um, and so that, they have to successfully go for, through that um, before they start the competency-based program. If they, they're not successful, we'd probably talk to them and say, you know, you might be a better fit for a fully online program 
or for a blended program. The, um, the competencies are uh, bundled into um, eight terms, and each of those terms are six months long. So for us, the student starts in term one, these, this bundle of competencies are open, and they'll work on all of these simultaneously. Ours is an online program that's iPad ready, mobile ready. So they're doing this all online. Um, we also, the competencies, now some competency-based programs allow students to choose which ones they want to start with. For ours, it's very intentional learning through a curriculum mapping and looking at uh, levels of learning. Students have to accomplish these before they go to the next bundle so that um, the faculty orchestrated which ones they should do first and then second, et cetera. So it's, uh, it's very orchestrated. Um, the assessments are divided into two levels. One is uh, the level one, which is, which is objective assessment, and the second is performance-based, so things like if you're giving a speech or doing a paper or doing a portfolio. Um, currently, the whole BBA program is 60% uh, performance-based, but interesting, the general education, those 13 competencies, only three of those are objective-based. Everything else is performance-based. Um, our faculty is uh, what we call an unbundled faculty model. So we have full-time faculty that serve the competency-based education uh, program. They are uh, tutorial faculty, primarily responsible for ensuring student success academically. So say if I were a student and I'm in a competency in English and I'm having difficulty, <laughs> I would have that full-time faculty member whose discipline is English to help me. Um, <clears throat> We developed our program, and you'll see in competency-based education that um, um, uh, I think that institutions choose kind of two routes to building these. Um, either it's a, uh, what I call a deconstruct-reconstruct, where you take an existing degree program, kind of bust up all the course learning outcomes, organize them in another picture, and then um, now it's competency-based. They've kind of redone an existing program. For us, we did uh, what I call an origin framework, so that you heard that our general ed is based upon DQP and AAC and U Leap. Um, the business part was based upon ONET, uh, uh, Department of Labor data, and in addition to certification. So that's what determined those knowledge, skills, and abilities for competencies. The program at uh, Brandman is approved by our regional accreditor, which is WASC. And we also received in October uh, the Department of Education direct assessment approval. So we're one of the four institutions. Um, so um, yay, that was a big day. Um, <laughs> so in closing, the, the key features in our program, uh, one technology, you heard that it's mobile uh, ready. It's on iPad, so it's anytime learning. Students can take it anywhere with them. Has data analytics and dashboards. For students, dashboards for coaches, uh, dashboards for faculty. It has an adaptive learning engine, so students aren't going through materials that they already know. They're tested, they move on. Um, and it's based on game-based learning. Um, it's affordable. It's $5,400 a year. Uh, all you can learn, no textbooks. Everything is within the module, so everything is embedded. Um, the quality and rigor is based upon the assessments. We develop these through uh, backward uh, design, which is you develop the competency first, then the test blueprint, what are you going to assess, your assessments, and then build your educational journey. So what are the activities that will support that learning? Um, students are supported through tutorial faculty. They also have uh, uh, coaches who help with the kind of tracking the student engagement. Um, we have an online writing, the math center, and there's a social networking in the platform. So, Sharla, you have a great program. <laughs> too. Wait, so tell, tell us about your, your program. <laughs> Wait, before you go, though, because you said it, so you, I'm sorry, to, so you said that you were approved for direct assessment. What does that mean? So direct assessment allows um, institutions to provide Title IV funding, so financial aid, within a competency-based education program. 
So the competency-based education program, and Amy is the queen here of the paper that talks about blowing up the credit hour, so to speak, and focusing on learning and not thinking about it's over this amount of time, it's really this amount of learning. So um, we are now, uh, as an institution, can give financial aid for students in the competency-based education program. Thanks. Well, uh, good afternoon. I'm Charlotte Long, and it's a pleasure to be with you. I wondered who would stick around at 4.30. So either your boss is sitting next to you, which is there's not many people sitting next to somebody. So I'm assuming that hopefully you're really interested in this and we'll be able to meet your needs today and, and uh, trying to at least share a little bit of our experiences. I appreciate Allison's question about what is it that caused us a um, – private, faith-based liberal arts institution that had been around for 125 years, hadn't revised our general education in 40, um, wondering what led us down this path of competency-based education. And in really 2006, at that time I was chairing the Department of Management within the College of Business, attended an AACSB conference, and began talking about competency models in the HR setting from employers. And my husband was an HR executive. I went home and I said, you know what? I heard at this conference about your competency models. That's exactly what we do, but we don't call it that. I mean, we're trying to develop these kinds of competencies in our students, but that's not the label we use. And we began having this conversation about the commonalities between what employers wanted and what I wanted to be producing as students, just using different names on that. And so we really began um, a journey where the university licensed a commercial competency model in 2007. It's a model that's used by um, about 100 of the Fortune 500 companies as they select employees, develop them, help guide them in their businesses. And I thought, boy, if we could figure out in academia how we connect my words to an employer's words, how I can ensure that what they're looking for is what I also am kind of looking for, wouldn't that be a great way to make a, a, a wonderful bridge between the academy and also the employer? Now, for some of you in here, you might be saying that's not our job, right? And I hear that a lot on campus. You know, my job is not to make a, a student workforce ready. But at Lipscomb, we did feel like students were coming to us so that they would have more career opportunities, be more workforce ready, and so we wanted to think about how we address that. So that was a real driving force behind our competency-based model. And as you look at our work, we are fully engaged uh, with workforce issues. So thinking through what does our state need, uh, what does our community need, what do we need from a degree, are they meeting, you know, are we producing the kinds of graduates that we want? When we um, surveyed um, employers of our graduates, many of them said they're really good people, but it took me a while to train them up and get them to where I needed them to be. They just weren't quite ready from day one. Great people, though. Great ethics, good morals, all that stuff is wonderful. And we really looked, and you, when you say that employers spend about $126 billion a year on training and development, they spend $20 billion a year on tuition reimbursement, boy, if we could find a way to bridge to that money and meet their needs more directly, we've got a way to get access to college to employees of companies that would have never been able to come to college. And so that seemed like a really nice um, connection. Our program, and you could talk to any of the 200 looking or at least those 20 of us that have fully been launching and, and running students through, we all have, see, I already ran one off. Goodbye. Um, we all have, that was just to put pressure on the rest of you. If you did, I, I did it to you too. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. If you have to catch a flight, feel free. But anyway, uh, if not, stay here. The, uh, the, it's the teacher in me. I'm sure you all know that. Um, every one of us have different approaches based on what works for our institution, based on what works for the students that you're trying to serve. So our model is based around behavioral assessment. So students who come in, a new student to our program begins in a course that includes an eight-hour behavioral assessment. And in that behavioral assessment, they go through simulation activities, uh, role plays, 
Um, they give presentations. They do activities both individually and in small groups with people they've never met before. All of while uh, three certified faculty members are assessing them behaviorally. The following day they come back, they get a report on how they performed, and that report serves as the basis for all of the rest of their engagement with their, their, the institution and their degree program. So if they demonstrate competency in certain areas, then I want to fill the gaps. So again, it's a cost savings. They don't have to take classes that we can prove and they can demonstrate that they already have that competence. So we create that customized learning plan. We have a whole badging ecosystem that underlies everything we do. So employers would call and say, I'd really love to put somebody through your problem solving and decision making program or your course in that. Well, I'd like to be able to say, you know, if you go through that program with us, we'll give you a badge. That badge could be transcripted for credit if you ever wanted to pursue a degree. So really with an employer paying for the course, they've really had the opportunity to earn the college credit which is helping with the accessibility and the affordability issue. So we have a whole badging ecosystem, about 164 badges currently that we can award at our institution based on everything from wit written communication skills, problem solving, creativity, uh, on and on and on, a, a pretty uh, good list of those. With the customized learning plan, it really meant we had a modularized content. So if you think about, you're saying you're only gonna need to buy those competencies you don't have, how do you sell? How do you deliver just the content they need? And that's where we've worked to really modularize a lot of the content um, at Lipscomb that supports this program. And so we offer a Bachelor of Professional Studies, uh, and it allows for a student um, to take our core, um, but also in addition to that, to customize really with any other academic program that they desire. Because we're in the wonderful state of Tennessee where our governor believes in a free co a community college education, this is an associates to bachelor's program primarily, although students could come to us without an associates, but they would go in a traditional class to finish up that. Um, but our state, there's free community college tuition, so it really didn't make sense to compete with community colleges, so we really work on what do we do in that third and fourth year for completion. Um, We've been really blessed um, with a great number. We also can offer it in a Bachelor's of Arts and Bachelor's of Science in another format. But we were the first SACS accredited school, and um, I appreciate the work at SACS of getting our proposal um, evaluated and looked at, and that was a, a great blessing. Um, we as an institution will seek uh, direct assessment approval as well. It's kind of an interesting thing, I don't know that we've even talked about, but uh, this month we will be launching our assessment center at the Tennessee Prison for Women. Mm -hmm. And um, we actually had an associate's degree program at the Tennessee Prison for Women, and the ladies had read about our work um, and asked if we would bring our competency-based program to the prison, because for many of them, they'll be released before they've taken one little course at a time and one little course at a time and one little course at a time. And so we're excited to be able to take uh, the competency-based program to the Tennessee Prison for Women this fall. We're doing it um, in an inner city location at a homeless shelter as well, trying to help those folks that find themselves um, challenged with housing um, that have had great work experience and need to be able to find that entry point back in. So really great, great opportunities to use competency-based education in a whole wide market, range of markets, but those are a couple kind of really out there maybe non-traditional ways to do that. Mm -hmm. So, Amy, how are you today? <laughs> I'm good, and I'm now just getting re-energized hearing both of you talk about this and what's, you know, what's happening. So, um, so at the national sort of federal level, I'm, I'm to turn that mic. Oh. oh, sorry. Can people hear me or no? Yeah, all right. A little, all right. Get a little closer. Um, <laughs> sorry. Don't be shy. Sorry. Um, so, so just a little bit of background for me. So I currently work at a think tank, but I used to work in the federal government. So at some point, I'll probably end up being an apologist for, you know, some, you know, the Department of Education or Congress or the White House or something like that. So that's fine. Sit in the back. You can't throw things at me. But just so my, sort of my perspective here is like is trying to share what I think is happening at the sort of national federal policy level around CBE. 
it's competency-based education. I'll just start using the jargon. Um, and it, I think this is really CBE's time in the sun. It seems like, um, and it's absolutely tied to this question about the Iron Triangle. I mean, uh, and the question, certainly for policymakers, the, the most pressing question, I'm not saying it is the most important question, but it's the one that I think is motivating so much of the interest, is the cost question. But we have a completion agenda, right, that is very much a national agenda, and tied to that is a quality agenda, right? So yeah, you can give people degrees and give them certificates and give them credits, but if it's not worth anything, what, you know, what does that mean? Are we sort of devaluing higher education? But even beyond that, I would say, um, and I think this is part of the framing for a lot of this conference is, you know, well, maybe this isn't how the AAC and you would frame it, but I think that that higher education has sort of for a long time sort of just been trusted. Like, okay, you all are doing a good job, that's great, we're gonna trust you and sort of leave you alone, but mm, there isn't as much trust anymore. And I think in part because the stakes are higher, I think higher education has never been more important and it's never been more expensive. And that's expensive for students, for, for taxpayers, for all of the, you know, state legislators, for everybody. So, so folks are really trying to struggle with how do we make sure that people can have an affordable but high quality and a knowable quality education. And that's sort of the promise of you know, competency-based education. I'm not saying that's what it always does, but that's sort of the vision, right? So, so everybody in Washington's talking about it. Love it, love it, love it. I mean, the, as everybody probably knows, even those of you who aren't in the Beltway, there isn't a lot of love between um, the different branches of government right now. <laughs> There's not a lot of love between the Democrats and the Republicans, but competency-based education is one of the few things people are agreeing on. The House of Representatives passed a bill unanimously, unanimously, the House, the whole House, uh, basically, <laughs> uh, basically sort of saying, we want to experiment with competency-based education. So, um, but sort of starting a little bit, uh, taking a, I don't know. She didn't mention the Senate. No, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. No, not the Senate. <laughs> we can talk about, the, yeah, we'll talk about the Senate. But um, President Obama in 2013 sort of you know, brought sort of very high level, presidential level, in fact, attention to this in a, in a speech he gave on higher education in which he said, look, basically, my goals for the, you know, I have three goals to try to basically break, you know, sort of the triangle. He didn't say that, but, um, he said three reforms to shake up the current system. Um, so one was a very beloved rating system, which <laughs> um, one was around income-based repayment and basically making you know, college more affordable on the back end through payments. And then the, the second, well, the third, for, anyway, was um, what the president said was um, to encourage more colleges to embrace innovative new ways to prepare students for a 21st century economy and maintain a high level of quality without breaking the bank. So pretty much the Iron Triangle. And then he, he went and called out Southern New Hampshire University's College for America and University of Wisconsin's uh, FLEX program. So exciting sort of rhetorical, yay, the president knows that these things exist and wants more of them to happen, that's great. What's he gonna do about it? And there were a few things that um, he has done. Um, so sort of a, um, not that it's really a small thing, but it's a smaller thing is um, sort of using, so ex using existing authority, uh, put some more money into the Center for the Study of Distance Education and Technological Advancements, in which he prioritized research on competency-based education. That's good, it's important. But what I think is most exciting is really where the money is. And the money is in federal financial aid. There's $150 billion a year in Pell Grants and loans. And up until recently, <coughs> those dollars could only be used to pay for time and not to pay for learning. They had to pay for the credit hour. They couldn't pay for learning. And so, um, so, uh, the administration did a few things. One is it used, it sort of dusted off this authority that Congress had given it and had never used called direct assessment and um, allowed, invited institutions to apply and say, okay, all right, we're gonna experiment, you know, we're gonna let you do this. So there are a few institutions who are doing that now. A second thing, um, sort of a big thing that, that they have started to do, that's sort of underway is what's called experimental sites. And just so that I can get a sense so that I'm not talking above or below, who has heard and it's okay if you do not raise your hand. Uh, who has heard of experimental sites? Oh, good. Okay, so we've got a. So it feels like they understand what they are. No, I don't. No. Yeah. Oh, that's good because oh. you can teach us. So that's great. That's a really. So actually, that's a much better question. No, no. A, I mean, no, no. That's a much better question. No, no. So no, no, no. You're right, though. Yes. Okay. Who's heard of them? What the heck? Are they? So good point. Uh, so. Experimental sites are basically a waiver, it's waiver authority that the Department of Education has to 
play with um, uh, both rules that it's created itself and laws that Congress has passed uh, around federal financial aid. So, um, so it's basically allowing a voluntary group of institutions to create a little laboratory around particular questions and topics. And the department has basically said, we're gonna do three experimental sites, well there are four, but only three that are related to this topic, <laughs> uh, around uh, competency-based education. One is around prior learning assessments. One would allow federal financial aid, which up to now uh, hasn't been used, uh, hasn't been allowed to pay for assessing prior learning uh, to do that. One would be to allow students um, to get financial aid if they're taking a mix of competency-based direct assessment programs and a mix of credit hour programs. And then one is a much more complicated um, full competency-based education um, experiment, which we could talk about if people want to get way in the weeds. It's like super weedy. It's like dispersive, waving disbursement rules and waving all sorts of stuff, but really interesting. Um, Wait. I'm sorry, yes. I'm interrupt you, but I do, the one thing that maybe is in the weeds here, but it is super yeah, interesting, yeah, no, no, is, go, the, go. is the peeling apart direct and indirect costs. Yeah, okay. Just explain that for just, just Yeah, sure. Okay. okay, so one of the things, great, all right, people want to get there, because that is one of the most interesting <laughs> things. So um, part of the struggle with competency-based education is um, if you're going to pay for t learning rather than time, it's like, what are you paying for? Do you pay, how do you pay for it? Do you pay when the students learn? What if they're they're sort of plodding through it and they're in something that's hard for them and they don't get their money but they still have to pay their rent check. Like, what do you do with that? So the department, I think, actually did something really creative mm -hmm. and said, um, okay, we're gonna separate these two costs. So costs that are direct, that go directly to the school, like tuition, fees, those you can um, disperse as students complete the competencies. And so it can be really flexible. Um, but for living costs, they have to be spread out over uh, um, in regular intervals, and at least four regular intervals, so that you know people can pay their bills and do those sorts of things, but also uh, the schools can experiment with what this model looks like and allowing students to go to move as quickly as they want without worrying like, oh, you know, I finished this competency, but I don't get my Pell Grant until you know, next semester, so I'm just gonna wait. No, no, actually, you can you know, sort of move forward now. So. So that's um, so. Sort of, those are two big things that the uh, I think uh, the administration has done to really help push. Um, and I think some of the movement from the federal side has nudged the accreditors to sort of say, you know, to sort of get together and say, okay, what are we doing about um, competency-based education? Because we're all sort of doing something different. And I think there's talk now that they're going to try to come up with some common standards and language about what it means so that it isn't contingent upon whether you're WASC or HLC, like oh, things are, you know, they're different. So I think that's a positive direction. Um, the new, I guess he's still new, um, Under Secretary Ted Mitchell, is he still? New? New enough. New enough. <laughs> um, is really focused on innovation and is a big proponent of competency-based education. So that's exciting. Again, bipartisan agreement on this stuff. So again, the House, unanimously crazy. In the middle of an intense budget, um, you know, everybody's cutting everything. We have sequestration. We have all this stuff. Congress found $75 million for a first-in-the-world um, <laughs> Uh, grant program to basically fund innovative things of which competency-based education is a part. Um, the Senate, while it has not passed a competency-based education bill, has introduced it, and it's bipartisan. It's um, you know with with you know really important sort of heavy-hitting senators from both sides of the aisle. So that's sort of a federal level. Their uh, state policy makers are increasingly interested in this. I think in terms of what what's next, um, higher ed uh, the Higher Ed Act is in the process of being reauthorized. So, you know, when it, that actually gets passed, who knows? But it's at least, what's that, this summer? All right, <laughs> from, from yeah, we'll see. <laughs> there, will, there have been bills introduced, um, bills will continue to be introduced, whether or not they're voted on, we'll see. But I think um, there, this is gonna be a space in which there's a lot of um, conversation, but, but I guess the, um, I think you, one of your, you sort of said, what are the questions? I think mm -hmm. there's still a lot of questions, like, um, and it's going to be sticky, and I don't actually know what HEA can really do about competency-based education right now, um, other than continue, that would be responsible, other than continue to promote sort of innovation that's controlled and thoughtful and where there's research, because, um, you know, you could you could create all sorts of havoc if you just say, oh, we're going to pay for everything, and maybe we can talk about that later. But I think, um, 
you know, I think it's really positive. I actually think the feds are being really responsible about how they're doing it. I do worry about state policymakers sort of just saying, oh, this is cheap and fast and, you know, we're just going to do a crappy program and call it competency-based education and really miss the value of CBE. Great. Um, thanks. So I want to get to questions from you guys, but I have a couple of questions just based on um, what you have talked about and also the kind of the what seem to be the sort of national narratives or the things that we often hear. And just piggybacking off of where you ended, um, Amy, you know, when you talked about states saying, well, let's just do this cheaper, faster. There's also, I think, the danger when you're looking at institutions, the explosion of interest among institutions, um, a great temptation um, in a world of fads around CBE to put new names on old ways of doing things and call it CBE. So what is it? when it's real, what is it when it's quality, um, is one of the questions that I think um, we continue to struggle with and it's something that I would love for you guys to address. But the, so I'm gonna just hit, this is really unskillful, I'm gonna hit you with like a 14 part question and then you can answer <laughs> what part of it you want to. So here are a couple of narratives, right? One is that CBE, CBE is just a, uh, a way to produce cheaper, faster, if we need lower quality, um, degrees, essentially a second track subprime learning for second class citizens would be the, probably the most egregious way to put it. Um, and then there are those who say that CBE actually is the path for higher education to fulfill its uh, fundamental promise to award <laughs> progression toward degree based on what students actually know, right? So where, where, what is the, you know, so what, what are the anxieties that are underneath that narrative and what are the things that people should understand about this. And I think a piece of this also goes to something that all of you talked about in one way or another. CBE is just workforce training. It's just workforce programs. It's not, um, you know, so workforce training versus liberal education, right? So what is CBE appropriate for? Um, so I think these are the kinds of questions that when you hear narratives out in the world around this topic, um, these are some of the things that surface. And so I want you guys to sort of dive in wherever you would like on that. <laughs> I would say, you know, we institutions share uh, some of those same concerns about quality uh, because I know Laurie and I get calls all the time from other institutions that are seeking to create a competency-based education program and they're going to launch tomorrow and they're just thinking about it today. Um, <laughs> it, it does scare you. Uh, it uh, makes us pretty nervous because we believe we have produced very high quality programs and bad actors can cause a lot of damage that we just as a field don't want, right? We believe we have something that's gonna really change the way higher education is delivered. Um, so some of the institutions have gone together. We created uh, the Competency-Based Education Network to try to support one another, to try to surface what are best practices, what does work well, what doesn't work well. Um, and that work has been underway for um, about a year now. And so um, some really cool stuff there. I think um, quality, you have to start with your assessment. It's not about your teaching, it's about your assessment. It's not about how much time they sent in the class or what you told them or what your course objectives were. It's about what did they actually learn? What can they translate into their life? personally, professionally, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not all workforce, but I also don't think that's evil. Um, but it's not all workforce. I mean, one of my favorite stories is a student who um, had gone through the assessment center and some competency development and came back to talk about what a difference it had made in his marriage because he realized <laughs> he didn't know how to listen. He was um, very argumentative. You know, some really ugly stuff. Uh, we had a student who was repulsive to be around. You've had these, I'm sure, in class before that you hate to say you are like the most repulsive thing, but through the competency-based work, we have to say that. 
you lack some real key competencies that are going to hurt you personally and professionally. We want to help you deliver them. He just is in our master's program now, just got an amazing job, and people have no idea how obnoxious he used to be, you know, 18 <laughs> months ago. So, I mean, we're, that's, those are the kinds of things. You can't, you can't let somebody go with mediocre. They can't make it with just halfway knowing it or knowing 70% you got to change them. And so does everyone share that common commitment that you got to stick to demonstration of learning? Um, and if you don't, you can't call yourself, you know, a competency-based education program. So those would be some thoughts. So I agree. The assessments, and we talked a little bit about uh, backward design. So the assessments are key. It's really determining what are the important things that you need to, uh, that students must uh, demonstrate learning for, and it's mastery. So institutions are saying, okay, you have to have 80% or whatever that is, but it's not that you can get a C and walk away, and then you're done with this. It's mastery of this competency. The other two pieces I would add to quality is looking at what I call the learning journey. So when we're looking at competency-based education program, this is what I say it's not. It's not, hey, you know what, you don't have to come to class, you can just come to the final exam. Take the final exam, done. It is not that. Competency-based education program is intentional learning. It's connecting the dots and scaffolding that. So when we're looking at programs, competency-based programs, we're asking, what is your educational journey? How did you develop the curriculum that's different? And that it's not just the term that we use, you know, internally, that it's not just window dressing. Um, Amy uses a term that I love. It says, you know, competency-based education is a sexy new term in higher ed. So everybody wants to say that's what they're doing, but that's the part that we really, you know, need to differentiate and ask those deep questions. So what is different in your curriculum? How are you doing your assessments? Are they defensible? Are they reliable and valid? Is it relevant? Is the curriculum and assessments relevant uh, to that discipline? The third piece I would add to competency-based education equality is student support. How are you supporting students in this educational journey? Are you just saying you are on your own? Uh, go learn it um, and then come back when you're ready. So what are the institutions doing to ensure that, that educational journey? Is that through formative assessments? Is that through different activities? Is that through student engagement? Those are the questions that we're asking. And is that with faculty? Yes. Right. So and thinking through what that faculty role looks like during this process. Is that something you could do independent of faculty and then you just pop back in every once in a while and they'll assess you? Or is that something that you're journeying through with a faculty member that's helping to guide you? You know, and so those are really big questions. And there are lots of different models, right? Yeah. So this is the other one of the things that we have learned through the through CBAN, the Competency Based Education Network, is that there are very different kinds of models, different kinds of faculty models, different kinds of student support models, self-paced, not so much self-paced, but there are, and this is why um, this desire of these institutions to surface shared standards of practice that can ensure quality, that can, that can help provide the kinds of assurances that people want while also protecting diversity in the field and diversity of programs. I know because this is a bee in your bonnet, I want to give you a minute to say something about It is about totally this. a bee in my bonnet. Do you know which bee I'm talking about? <laughs> about the liberal arts or yeah. no? Yeah, okay. Go for it. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> So first I want to say, so even though I was a, you know, a departmental person, so I'm a gender studies, I'm a liberal artsy fartsy person, right? So associates of arts degree in theater, a gender studies bachelor's degree. I believe in the liberal arts, I believe in the promise of it. I, I worry, so as somebody who thinks that um, competency-based education really can be transformational and should be transformational, but see that it can go down a terrible path really quickly, I want to implore everybody in this room to stop thinking of workforce and employment as, as bad words. They're not bad words. They're not antithetical to what you do. They're just, if the idea of a liberal education is to give students the tools they, they need to have meaningful, self-directed like, lives that are, that are sustainable, then those are, those are also, many of those skills are the skills that employers need, right? I mean, having a meaningful life and a self-sustaining life and being able to follow your passions, you have to be able to put bread on the table, right? You should be finding work that is enjoyable to you. Students care about employment. They want jobs. 
or I'm sure we can talk, well, do yeah, we want to talk about it now? Do we want to get in? So, well, so, so, but this doesn't mean that there's this instrumentalist view, like it's just we're turning out cogs or we're turning out thinkers. No, not at all. The 21st century demands people who can solve unscripted problems, as AACNU says, who can think critically. And so many of these programs, they're trying to create this, I mean, they're trying to create and do what higher education says it already does, but isn't doing by and large. I mean, you look at the employer survey that um, that uh, that AAC and you just just released, sort of just released right? I mean, if you look at if you look at learning, if you look at the you know the national assessment of adult literacy, and you look at the fact that 69% of college graduates couldn't compare opposing editorials, higher ed isn't doing what it should be doing, and it needs to be. And CBE for me is all about making learning transparent. And when I, and so I straddle a whole bunch of worlds all the time. So I, I'm listening to the academics, I'm listening to the business folks, and once you get past the the first sort of top line, we're preparing students to be citizens of the world. We're preparing students for the, or we're preparing students for the economy. Okay, whatever. <laughs> like once you get past that, like all the layers below it, we're talking about the same skills. We're talking about the same things. And if higher education, and I'm not saying everybody in higher education, but from sort of the policy perspective, I think uh, oftentimes higher ed is sort of seen as saying, no, 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 that's not us. Employment doesn't matter. Don't care. So you're going to start to see state legislatures saying, all right, fine, we're going to cut liberal arts. We're going to cut this because it's not relevant. It doesn't matter. It absolutely matters, and I think you have to make the case. Yep. Well, they've got four hands up. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, Amy. Oh, and could you say who you are? I'm Dan Butz at Merrimack College. Um, so first of all, thank you for having the panel. I think it's a great discussion. Um, I want to approach the quality question from a slightly different perspective of scale. Um, mm -hmm. For, just as an education scholar, uh, actually just my one line quip always is, teaching to the test is great so long as the test is great. Right. So I think that's completely fine. Well, so the question is, I think of uh, programs, I think of courses, I think of fields um, like physics, like calculus, like teacher preparation, which are highly prescriptive state by state. How does that work when you have 200 some CBE programs in certain stages of development? Do they have 250 different physics courses? Do you have the same learning objectives and it's all based on a specific textbook? Can somebody speak to the whole question of scale versus one-offs in more or less standardized disciplines and courses? Who wants it? You or Lori? I'll try. <laughs> so. It's a, it's a really good question, and I th it, if I'm understanding this, what you just described is actually our world now. So if you Absolutely. have physics right. uh, yeah. degrees in all these different institutions, right. are they, what are their common threads and where are their differences? Mm -hmm. And are we having that conversation about what the common threads and the outcomes are if you have a BA in physics from this degree or a, a graduate? Oh, so we're not, we're not. So I just want yeah, to know, yeah. Know, so here's, yeah, so here's the potential. Yeah, so here's... <laughs> So here's the potential, I think, with competency-based education. So let's just talk about general education. If, you, if you're going from framework, so with general education, my view of what's happened is we've developed this cafeteria style so that you have, you have nine credits in social science and you have so many in humanities. You, everyone knows you have to have English and math, but then the rest gets a little fuzzy. And, um, and so I think with... Um, with uh, competency-based education and actually in development of our program, the gen ed was the hardest. We had uh, faculty interdisciplinary have this conversation. What does it mean to be competent in social sciences? What does it mean to be competent in humanities? Does it really mean you can take any of these 20 classes and then you're competent? So what that allows is that beginning that we can have this conversation that general education and that you're competent in this, no matter what university you go, if we can agree upon what those things are. Now let's go to a major. Um, majors, if you have majors or disciplines that have frameworks or standards, it's easier. What's happened right now in the competency-based education world is the programs that have popped up, there's a, there is a liberal studies program, but most of them are in health science, you'll probably guess which ones, health science, business, and um, IT, right? Because they have existing professional standards. Everyone knows kind of what that looks and smells like. And so it's easier to have that conversation. So I think that competency-based education allows that dilemma that you described actually to happen, that across universities, we can start talking about what does it mean to have a baccalaureate degree in physics? 
What are the things that need to ride that students must demonstrate learning of? But I would, I, I would try to take that a step further. I think there is a group of us, and, and part of what we talk about in, in CBEN is, um, can we be transparent with how I assess, right? Would you tell me how you assess that consistently at your school and you tell me and you tell me, could we all maybe think about, these are five really quality assessment tools for that particular. So maybe when a person goes to transfer or when a person goes to uh, a graduate school, you know not only what they're competent in, but you know how it was assessed and how they scored on that assessment because that also lets you know transferability of that. So you know what? I think this has amazing promise of being able to think about because it's so focused on the quality of the assessment. Share it. Talk about it. So how are you assessing? Here's how I assess. You know, are those tools that we both could be happy with the assessment tools? So does that allow us to begin to transfer better? Does that allow for us to all kind of align around what it means to be competent in that particular thing? So there is conversation like that happening, um, and I think that should be an encouragement, really. So there are other questions, but I just very quickly want to point out, I'm sorry, Linda, to put you on. <laughs> I just want to note that you're here. So Linda Schott is here, um, president of the University of Maine of Presque Isle, and um, somebody to talk to you about these things, because you, you guys took it up, and I was thinking, taking it back down to what does it do to faculty conversations? Um, about, so we have a rich now, many year, we have more than a decade of very serious work in this country around learning outcomes, right? What is it that students were exposed to? What do we think they know? How do we, and I've heard Linda talk a bit about what it has done, you know, the, the kinds of conversations and the kinds of work that their faculty are able to do collaboratively on this particular, on this exact question of how do you know and how do you um, communicate that across boundaries with others about what students actually no one are able to do not just what students were exposed to. So I think you can look at it multiple ways, and I would just suggest that Linda's a resource. It's been a wonderful conversation on our campus, and I think our faculty were shocked at how little they knew, they thought they knew, but how little they really knew about what they were each teaching. And so having to develop rubrics and validate those rubrics across, uh, and not just in biology, but across so that uh, biologists can accept Yep. evaluate a communication competency, for example, Absolutely. in the general education curriculum has really led to some wonderful uh, conversations. And we're using the AAC and U, uh, you know, we started anyway with the AAC and U rubric, so we do have that uh, commonality with other institutions across the United States. Right. So you had a question, and then over here, and then over there, and then back there, and then up here. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the person that think tank, I uh -oh. <laughs> That's a bad way to start. I, 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 have an, I have an issue because I don't think um, in the guy that it is now, you can produce a person who works at a think tank. That's the thing. One thing about, you know, doing theater, doing gender education, exploration, right? Depth. Sure. You know? Um, employer, there is no employer that, I mean, that I know of that says, I want you to prepare people right, to be in think tanks. No, no, right? but it's not, oh, okay, sorry, go ahead. You need a certain kind of person with a certain kind of breadth and depth. Sure. Right? And, and that's literally educated. Sure. The Kali Fiorinas, I want you to produce someone who would be a CEO in about 10 years. Right? Go for it. I mean, she was a medieval history person, right? So I'm a philosopher. I know what I'm doing with my students. Mm -hmm. I know what happened to me. Sure. Right? I feed, I feed myself, I mean, I get sure. pretty well. Yeah. A couple of kids in college, yeah. doing okay, right? We're changing our gen ed, right? We're gonna have a developmental model, you know, something early, something later, something like that. But I, what I see in Lipscomb, especially, just for the person to your left, is you're preparing, I mean, you have a employee to pay for the education, okay? So we have a direct link, it's very closely tied, right? So you have an employer's wisdom. The kind of versatility that you need to be, a person's part of a think tank, Right, it won't be there in that program. I just don't see that. I don't see that linkage. So I'd encourage you to take a look because I actually would say it is, and I would say that we could map what are the competencies that a person who's going to work in a think tank need, and they're your liberal arts education competencies. Okay, okay? so I would I would push back a little bit and say we actually do, 
And I actually have research that can say, this is the kind of competencies that make up a person like an Amy. She needs to be an amazing relationship builder. She needs to have diplomacy. She needs to have these kinds of competencies. Where does she get that? Your philosophy class, right? And so competencies that she's going to learn and gain from your educational experience. So it's not eliminating the wonderful work you do. It's trying to find. It's the close linkage. I'm not worried about my job. What I'm worried about <laughs> are the opportunities for our students to explore, to have the kind of right. learning that they can sort of like. Oh, oh, oh. I, I can Sorry. Go, go. No, 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 go, go. Like whether I have a PPE is good for our country. Okay, no, I really feel like I have to I have to respond Maybe to this. I have to say something. I have to explode. Uh, no, I really I am going to explode. So that's no, very good. Um, so a few so I'm gonna so I was gonna read from this tomorrow at my this other session I'm on, but I'm gonna read from it now too. So a few one thing. So Southern New Hampshire University, which isn't on the panel but is another uh, competency based program, Associate of Liberal Arts working directly with employers, people, employers like the Slim Jim factory, employers like uh, health care, you know, I mean, things that aren't philosophy, aren't think tanks. It's a liberal arts degree. One of my favorite examples of one of the, the projects that they do is uh, students are basically given a bunch of objects and they have to curate a museum exhibition. So they basically have to take these objects that have no intrinsic meaning and they have to make relationships uh, like they have to decide how to curate it and they have to decide what to present and defend their choice that to me is liberal artsy fartsy like at its best right and it's because employers today don't need people who can just you know turn a machine they, like those are increasingly being outsourced roboticized etc employers need and want people who can solve new problems but really I'm gonna I have to read some of this okay um Sorry, are you, are you are you rolling your eyes like, please don't do this? No. You are? <laughs> I'm not. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> I'm not. No, cause, people can tell you I wasn't rolling my cause, eyes. No, because I would stop. <laughs> no, I <don't>. Okay. <laughs> I just, I love, okay, so this person who's talking about her time at um, Southern New Hampshire at College for America. Um, so she basically signed up. Um, I didn't want a program that cost me a lot of money because I needed to fund college for my two sons. I was working, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't know, what I didn't know was that CF, my CFA journey would be a, so much more than getting my degree. It was an honest to goodness liberal arts education. Again, it's like aimed at people who are working in Slim Jim factories. While in the program, I learned so many things. I learned about the lean principles, the Federal Reserve, globalization, the moral philosophies of Immanuel Kant, John Stuart Mill. I learned about the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Enlightenment, while exploring art from masters such as Donatello, Rembrandt, Manet, Picasso. It goes on and on and on and on and on about how then, and learning about listening, um, it helped me develop and acquire many of the skills that are critical to my job, and it gave me a wide variety of multi-part goals and projects to complete in the program, realistically simulating what's happening right here in the workplace. What's more, with CFA's self-directed learning model, I've learned how to be curious, how to be my own best teacher, a good recipe for figuring out how to recognize and solve problems. That, to me, is... <laughs> so... <laughs> Question. Yeah, go for it. Uh, so, so... I think, I think the last question raised some of the intellectual concerns, and, and having looked at Southern New Hampshire, I can say that it's a lot of skills-based stuff and a lot of applied stuff, but it's not a liberal arts model. In fact, there's very little liberal arts. Um, there's very little engaged with the arts. So it's a liberal education model that's extracted from the arts. But I have another question, which I'm having trouble with. Okay, so you raised some of the concerns intellectually, and you say there's good ways to do it and bad ways to do it. So, so we want to do it the good ways, and I'm, I'm on board. I guess my question is, I have a hard time disaggregating CBE from the labor question. And the labor question is, accredited art didn't exist to measure student learning. It ensured the economic security and academic freedom of a sustained and sustainable academic faculty. The big models, Southern New Hampshire, Western Governors, it sounds like Brandman as well, are moving to this unbundled model, this sort of tailorized faculty model that destroys the teacher-scholar. So my question is not mm -hmm. so much, can we do CBE right or wrong? Because clearly you've suggested we can do it right. I want to know, how do we disaggregate that from the labor model that is actually threatening mm -hmm. to the academy, destroying the academy, and, and in fact, um, and those kinds of questions? So, because I'm having trouble taking those two narratives apart. And this is where I wish David Scable from Wisconsin um, was with us. He was supposed to be with us on this panel today, and he couldn't be here, but I have heard him speak quite a bit about this, and I wouldn't dare to give his answer here on his behalf, but I'm curious 
what you guys have to say about that. So um, it's, a, it's a good question, and it's, it's, it's especially important to have this conversation here. So um, I think that we would be naive to think that the faculty model isn't already changing. Um, because we, you know, the majority of faculty are not your ten, tenured faculty at R1s. That is not the majority of your counting numbers. They do exist. I'm not, but that's not the, so it's already changing. The adjuncts, right? Yeah, and there's a huge amount of adjunct uh, instructors that are serving our students, you know, as faculty members. So that's the reality. Um, taking that into consideration, I mean, at Brandman, let me just tell you, we, you know, our um, tutorial faculty are responsible for teaching. They're working in their content, working with students. They are responsible for scholarship, and they're responsible for service. So I'm not sure the part that's unbundled is that this faculty member, tutorial faculty, is not the assessor. Now, some of you as faculty members, you probably had pockets of your faculty role that you were really good at and things that you either weren't as good at or simply did not like doing. I taught statistics, I like grading stat exams. I taught capstone, I didn't like grading capstones. So, um, but I felt like I was good at that part working with students. The faculty also, some are really good at developing courses and building those learning activities. Others aren't. We're not good at everything. We're asked to do everything. So I think it allows that opportunity for faculty. Actually, what are the things that you are really good at as a faculty member. So I don't think it's less than, I think it's different than. So I, if, so just, I feel like, I don't know why, I feel like I do have to channel David on this as well. And this is, I'm a faculty member in the humanities, is my background and probable future after I'm fired by public agenda, bring it back <laughs> into things. But um, I think one of the, you know, as you ask your question, and I think this is one of the most dis difficult kinds of questions that needs to be asked honestly, if higher education exists to support a traditional labor model for scholars, then CBE is a fundamental threat. If higher education in this country exists to fulfill this country's promise to its people that education is a path to a better future regardless of accidents of birth or fortune, then that conversation has to change. And as a faculty member, I find it a scary conversation, but it's one that needs to be had. And it's one that needs to be had honestly. So I think that there are lots of different ways to do it. But it's a really important question, but I think disentangling protection of traditional labor models from questions about what it is that higher education is supposed to be in a democracy is a, is a conversation that faculty have a responsibility to get into constructively, essentially. I think you need both. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. right, That's right. Back. That's exactly right. Yep. Yeah. Wait, I'm the, moder I'm the moderator. I shouldn't say anything. No, you should. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Oopsie. Like, I'm a Dewey Scholar. All right. Um, there was a qu was yeah. there another was question there? over here? Because there was a question over there. Oh, she left. The person who had the question left. Do you think we made her mad? OK. All right, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, OK, uh, I'm also a philosopher, uh, so I don't want to gang up on you. But uh, no problem. <laughs> I feel very mixed about this. And like my other philosophy colleague, in philosophy in particular, but I think in humanities in general and the liberal arts, we think about the transformation of the human person mm -hmm. as fundamental to education. And so I heard what you said, the student from Southern New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. I don't quite believe it. And what I mean by that is not that I don't believe that what she says is true, but I've seen in the classroom when a student really is transformed by Plato, that their world changes, that when you make them question their assumptions about their religion, their background, et cetera, that their world opens up in a different way. And I think the, what we call this in general is the moral development of a student. How does CBE address that or doesn't it? And maybe that we just let that go and that's not part of the mission of the university any longer to your point. Oh, oh we don't let that go. Yeah. I, I, we, don't let, we don't let that go. It's just happening in a little bit different way. So instead of it being maybe in a classroom with 20 people, it might be a journey that a faculty member and that student take together. Um, we have affinity groups in which people are being grouped with other people that um, can help challenge their thinking and some groups that are people like themselves. There's all kinds of ways that we're really intentionally trying to make that happen and allow that to happen even though they may not ever step on my campus which they might ours do 
but to make sure that there's that deep connection and that transformation of who they are as a whole person. Um, that is a very deliberate part, especially for us as a faith-based institution, that's a very deliberate part about how we have structured our program as well. Um, so I, I guess I can say you can question it. I've watched it. I've experienced it the same way you have, and it happened in a very different way. There are still tons of students on our campus that are having that very um, traditional type experience that you just talked about um, with that product line, but I've also watched it with this competency-based education and watched people completely be changed in the whole. Um, so I, I'd say that's a piece of look at the quality. Have they thought about that? Have they thought about ways to build that in? Have they created opportunities and that <coughs> learning journey to make sure that happens? Now there's your quality program, right? Do you have examples of that, how you've engendered that in your program? In ours in particular, absolutely. So anybody who starts our program after they've gone through an assessment center, they spend time with a coach. And that is a faculty member that's had additional training to make sure that they're comfortable in that one-on-one -on -one having that very intimate and deep conversation. Okay, so they go through a pretty robust training program to be able to coach a student. And then as they're delivering feedback about what are your strengths, they're talking about what are, what's happened in your life. Tell me about your experiences. What brought you to this place? Where do you wanna go? What are the things that hold you back? What are so very deep conversations that a lot of times we don't get to have with our students in our classrooms traditionally unless they're coming by your office, et cetera, right? Then they're placed in affinity groups um, in which they're working on those assignments that are intentionally designed to raise those kinds of questions. Um, they're interacting with different subject matter experts or so different faculty all along the way to make sure that they're getting that transformational experience. In the same way, we can't guarantee that happens for every class student in a traditional program I can't guarantee that either, but we work very intentionally to try to make that happen. Um, I invite anybody, you know, to come and take a look at the program and, um, you know, I'm sure uh, Laurie feels the same way, other colleagues do as well. We have people who come, Amy came and watched it, I think, uh, as well. So when you see the transformation that can take place, I'd encourage you to reserve that feeling until you look at a couple and see, man, how does that happen in a different way? I think it's also important to say that this is not, I think for a lot of people, um, particularly when it's viewed as a threat, that CVE is another option. It's another yeah. way for a whole, if you look at the, the learners in this country who, for whom traditional higher education is not working, that there is no place, right, for those students to um, have the, it, to, to find that, to have that journey, that this is not something that is, I don't think anybody's saying this is how all of higher education should work, right? Um, and as a former faculty member who was never asked, how do you know when your students are learning? And my answer would have been, I see the transformation before my eyes. If I was asked now to say, how do you work with other people in your discipline or get the kind of support and training you need to be able to articulate and to help students articulate what that is when it happens, right? That's not something that subject matter experts in history of ideas or in any of the subjects that I, you know, were, we, we weren't given that support, right? Um, that's why I think AACNU is such a profoundly important network and resource for faculty members to get that kind of, I mean, that's why there are all these connections between GEMS, VALUE, LEAP, CBE, DQP, I mean, all the, like the acronym, acronym soup, you know. Um, wait, hold on, not you again, but you, yeah. But sometimes. Oh, and this man. And this yes. yeah. oh, I'm sorry. been waiting. Yeah. Yeah. He's Go ahead. Yeah. And then, yeah. Uh, uh, two things. One, I, I take your comment. I think Five part of what you were saying, if I can say this, is that not every change in a human being can be comfortably described as an advance in their competence. Hmm. And I've been discovering that too, thinking about faculty. Hmm. You know, what does it take for a faculty member to be successful in a system hmm. like this? And I started by just trying to describe all those changes in terms of improvements in their capacities or their capabilities. Yeah. And then I began running up against some things which were very uncomfortable to describe that way. Um, it's more like a change in worldview or a change in who you are. Uh, it's just not easy when you're saying, this is all about what you're capable of doing 
to then incorporate the things mm -hmm. you've been talking about for the last 30 minutes mm -hmm. and say, in a comfortable way, or, or maybe you would disagree with that, but that's the way it sounds to me, and I think, I think to you too. The comment that I wanted to make uh, has to do with the uh, title of this session. You've been talking about narratives. Um, and I think one of the uncomfortable narratives is, is there an iron triangle, or actually is there a myth? Um, I think the idea of the iron triangle comes from the assumption, which I think is false, that quality is a function of resources per student. So the more students you have, unless you can increase the budget, the less resources for each one, so quality goes down. Uh, if you want to increase quality, you have to do that by excluding some people or at the very least creating a tiered system where some students get more than others do. But we've been through a lot of situations, especially when technology changes, when something much more complicated happens, and you can have certain kinds of gains in quality while their losses are happening, certain kinds of gains in access while losses are happening, certain ways in which it becomes more expensive, and simultaneously ways in which it's becoming cheaper. And if you think about the era of Socrates when learning was really about apprenticeship and talking and demoing, and then try to describe what happened when books came in, right. mm -hmm. and people were reading and writing that's a dramatic And Socrates was opposed to books. He was opposed to the written word. He thought it was this newfangled invention, this technology that would undermine the the deep thinking and people would just be the, you know, would be sort of repeating things and they wouldn't really have grasped it. I mean, he was really anti the book technology. So it's an yeah, interesting and I don't know why this predictions came true even though the opposite is also. Came true. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on whether he was imagining the world becoming correspondence courses. I think. Yeah, yeah. I was predicting what would happen when we were only reading books. Yeah. And I think his, his predictions were, were pretty accurate. So when I look at um, programs like this, transformative programs like this, I see on the cost side, the good old revenue theory of costs, that costs go up when revenues mm -hmm. go up. You know, British Open University used to be much cheaper than other ways of educating people. Their budgets went up. Now they're not so much cheaper than mm -hmm. other ways of doing it. And similarly, what Bowen showed was you can have two institutions look a lot alike yeah. um, and be spending very different amounts of money mm -hmm. per student and spending it quite differently. The challenge is to make the changes you want slowly enough mm -hmm. so that we can change the way we're spending our time, which is the biggest um, uh, biggest element of our costs. It's the human capital. Yeah. And that can only modify, be modified slowly if you're talking about an existing institution. Right. Yeah. So you need to have a target, I think, ahead of you that for 5, 10, 15 years saying, we're going to keep working in that direction. And in the process, we are going to create higher quality, greater access, mm -hmm. and more manageable costs. Not assuming that one of them drives the other. Those are three, to some degree, disjoint goals, all of which are important. But the good news is you can pursue all three of them at once, especially if you're patient and persistent enough. Okay. Agreed. I mean, we only have a couple of minutes, or maybe we're out, but was there another question? I think right here. Right. Oh, yeah, that's right here. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Actually, just partly in response to you. I'm Rebecca Charoff. I work in the University of Wisconsin system. You channeled the oh. stable really yes. well. Uh-oh. Oh, my gosh. He's going to hear. Don't tell him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this great opportunity to hold the mirror to our traditional programs and how we how we train quality, how we yeah, demonstrate quality, how we provide authentic evidence of student learning. And there's a great dialogue going on for all of us, I think all the institutions as we offer both traditional and new CBE programs to sort of have those, you know, the, the new CBE pieces of it, which insist on much better direct assessment of student learning, um, that feeds right back into your traditional curriculum some assumptions arising that these students are in time, just so you know. falls in the wood and you don't see it, did it really fall? Um, yeah, it probably did. So, okay. I'll stop there. All right, so we are out of time, but one last question in the back. 
I'll and actually more of a comment, sort of a piggyback off of that. Um, we often talk about, and my president is Paul LeBlanc, it's something we have here first. Oh no, he's going to hear all these people. <laughs> <laughs> saying here. All right. But what he will say is the same thing that uh, he said a number of times, and we say, um, I run the um, College of Online Continuing Education there. And the question ultimately is, what type of education problem are you trying to solve? And often when you talk about CBE, there seems to be, um, it seems to be seen as an existential threat to the self-acculturation process of an 18 and 22 year old. And it's not, no one's saying that that's going to go away. Uh, but at the same time, you do have other audiences that will need different models of education out there that have to move forward. So being able, and at the same time, they can learn from each other. One of the things that we've learned at SDA2, because we have College for America and our online division and our division campuses, is how, do you, how are you gonna talk to each other? What can you learn from each other? But they have to all exist at the same time because competency-based education as a model is not for every student or for every faculty member. The same thing's gonna be true for the 18 to 22 year old experience that our Brown campus has as well. But being able to learn from each other, being able to say, how do we measure learning? How do you actually assess what's going on in the classroom to the traditional campus is extremely useful. At the same time, all of those models need to exist at the same time. So I don't think it, it shouldn't be seen as a threat because it's not meant to try to eliminate one of the other models. It's simply saying this is something that also has value. Well, on that, yeah. so, thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah.